Thank you, Ben, for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you here today. Friends, there are very few times in the world where markets are transformed. People talk about transformation all the time, but genuine transformation is actually pretty rare. And I assure you that we are living through one of those times right now. As impactful as the World Wide Web, as transformative as the iPhone and the smartphone revolution, the age of artificial intelligence is upon us right now. This is a transformative time for everyone, including the market for legal services. During transformative times, I think it's more important than ever to study history. And in that spirit, I wanna share a story with you today um, about the history of transformation. Today, I wanna to tell you the story of a dominant incumbent that couldn't change, the startup that disrupted it, and the company that killed that startup. So I think it's important uh, to know at the start what a dynamic and transformative company Blockbuster was. You know, today we kind of use Blockbuster as a punchline, but Blockbuster was a really big deal. Um, before Blockbuster, if you wanted to watch a movie, you could either watch it in the theater or maybe by chance it would come on TV many years later, right? There was like a whole night set up for this. ABC is like Monday night at the movies. And once a week, they would show one movie. This is the whole world, by the way, before Blockbuster. So Blockbuster was an innovator. Blockbuster was a change maker. Blockbuster put rental stores in every neighborhood in America. In your neighborhood, you could, uh, you could see actually um, just hundreds of titles, right? And for the first time, you could rent the movies. Um, sorry, Matt, could you go back just one slide? Uh, you could rent these movies. Uh, Matt, sorry, back two slides, thank you. The transformative effect of technology. Trust me when I say Blockbuster was a giant deal. For the first time, consumers had control over what movies they watched. Blockbuster, from a very young startup, became a huge sensation around the country. We sort of use it as a punchline today, but I want you to realize Blockbuster was one of the biggest countries in America and in fact, one of the biggest companies in the whole world. Blockbuster was an innovator, not a perfect company, mind you, right? When you checked out movies at Blockbuster, you were limited to whatever they had in the store. And those of you who visited Blockbuster can tell you that they didn't always have what was in stock. You wanted to watch a hit movie, sometimes you ended up with like Goonies 3 or something, right? Whatever they had on the shelf. Blockbuster also was on cassette tapes which you had to rewind before you returned to the store. Don't rewind the tape, you pay a fee. Return the tape a few days late, you pay a fee. So it wasn't a perfect business, but it was a big business. So at its peak, Blockbuster was making almost $6 billion in revenue every year. There were 9,000 Blockbuster stores. For context, that's more stores of Blockbuster than there are all of Starbucks. Blockbuster was everywhere, okay? There were 60,000 employees uh, of Blockbuster. It was so big that in one year, they charged more than $800, $800 million in late fees just for one year. This was an important part of their business. People hated them. But the late fees didn't do Blockbuster in. It was actually one late fee that did Blockbuster in. Because somewhere around 1997, they charged $40 in late fees to an entrepreneur named Reed Hastings. And Reed Hastings said, this is stupid. Blockbuster never has the movies that I want. Uh, the tapes are kind of inconvenient. I shouldn't have to pay 40 bucks. I could probably buy the movie for 40 bucks somewhere. 
So he started a new company called Netflix. Netflix had this disruptive business model. First of all, they were gonna start with, with DVDs, a relatively new technology at the time. Not many people had DVD players. But he said, we're gonna use DVDs instead of tapes. No rewinding. Second, you just join Netflix. You pay a monthly fee and you pick three movies, they send them to your house. There's no due date. So when you watch the movies, you put them back in the envelope, you mail them back and you get the next three movies. Watch them whenever you want, okay? No limited supply, no rewinding, no late fees ever. So Netflix was a pretty disruptive company, but they had a problem. They were a small company and they were vastly unprofitable. The year that they made $3 million, the year 2000, it cost them $50 million. Netflix needed a partner. So for most of the year 2000, they reached out to Blockbuster and they had the following proposition. Blockbuster, you continue to run your very profitable bricks and mortar stores. We will be the online DVD component for Blockbuster. Netflix will become the front line for Blockbuster. And for a year, they tried to get a meeting with Blockbuster and they couldn't. Finally, somewhere near the end of that year, they went on a retreat in California. Uh, the retreats for Netflix were pretty casual. I think Reed Hastings, uh, the most formal thing he brought with him was a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, Mark Randolph, the other co-founder, had only shorts with him uh, and flip-flops. And of course, during that retreat, they got the call from Blockbuster saying, come to Dallas today. They actually rented Vanna White's corporate jet <laughs> and flew in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts and flip-flops to Dallas, Texas, to one of the biggest headquarters of a company in America, uh, Blockbuster Incorporated. And at this meeting, they said, we want to be your front end. Blockbuster said, we sort of see the vision. How much should it be to acquire little Netflix. And Reed Hastings said, $50 million. This is what the crew at Netflix uh, at the time looked like. Um, according to people who were in that meeting, uh, Blockbuster audibly laughed. Laughed them out of the room, right? They said uh, $50 million for a company that's making $3 million. $50 million for a company that's $47 million unprofitable this year? Reed, Mark, you guys are out of your minds. Get out of here. It will never work. And so on the flight back from Dallas to their corporate retreat, Mark Randolph said, that is when I knew we had to destroy Blockbuster. I love the image of them in this corporate jet owned by Vanna White in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts and flip-flops, leaving Dallas, committing themselves to changing this $6 billion market. But history tells us that's exactly what they did. Over the next seven years, Netflix got major inroads into American households. DVD players became more popular. The movies were higher fidelity and people liked the flexibility. They don't pay late fees. They don't have to go to stores. Everything was always in stock and they never had to rewind a DVD. By the time 2007 came around, it was pretty clear that Netflix had a dominant position. Blockbuster stores were starting to close around the country. That $6 billion market had become much smaller for Blockbuster and much bigger for Netflix. It was a time of transformative change Around 2007, something else was happening though. Broadband internet was becoming available to most Americans. People who had been accessing the internet through AOL and through dial-up for the first time were getting high-speed internet into their houses at a speed that was available to download movies. And so Netflix, which had fought tooth and nail to get into all of these American households, made the crucial decision to destroy their own business. Netflix had to disrupt Netflix. It wasn't an easy decision. It wasn't a popular decision, 
But once they realized that people could rent movies by downloading them into their houses, they knew the whole world had changed. And so they had to create a streaming service to disrupt their own largely popular business. It was ridiculed at the time, but I think we can see today it is one of the most impactful business decisions ever made. And of course, uh, we know that today, Netflix is one of the biggest businesses in the world. It has $32 billion of revenue as compared to Blockbuster's $6 billion of revenue. Its market cap isn't $50 million, it's $200 billion. So what do we learn from this story? I think there's really three key messages uh, that we learn. Three key insights into this time of transformative change in 2000 and 2007. And the first of these is that innovation shows us broader horizons. So Blockbuster as a big company with $6 billion owned the market for home rentals, but there was a market beyond that. And so when Netflix disrupted themselves, they did so to see a broader horizon to attack the $32 billion market. You see this uh, a few times in history. Uh, there's a author named Bill Sharp who talks about horizon theory. You can sort of see there's a peak and a valley of Blockbuster and then the Netflix DVD uh, shipping business, but then finally Netflix, Netflix streaming. Each of these horizons is bigger and farther along than the previous one. This is our story. Our profession has served clients since the time of Atticus Finch in roughly the same way. The invention of the World Wide Web transformed that market, um, but still it remains a relatively static market. The Thomson Reuters Legal Executive Institute uh, sets the size of that market at $473 billion. That's the market for legal services in America today. But as anyone will tell you, only about 20% of people in America who have legal problems come to us to solve them. 80% of people who have legal problems in America don't get them resolved at all. This is the latent market for legal services. Now, I don't think that the latent market is four times the size of the legal services market, but there's every reason to believe that the latent market, the other 80% is just as big as the currently served 20%, which means that the full size of the legal market should be something more like $1 trillion. This is a horizon that we can see beyond the current legal services market, just like Netflix could see beyond the video store and the video mailing market. This horizon is in front of us today. As the world of artificial, and cha artificial intelligence changes, we have the opportunity to see the people who we aren't serving, the 80% uh, of the legal services market. And uh, this is a real advantage for ALA members and for others because there's probably $500 billion of unmet legal need. That means that we could be helping a lot more people and make money at the same time. Okay, the second lesson I wanna take from this is a mindset, okay? The change in mindset from scarcity to abundance. In the world of blockbuster, movies were scarce. Uh, but in truth and fact, movies weren't scarce. VHS cassettes were scarce, right? There were movies all over the place. In, in 2000, there were actually a ton of really good movies made. Uh, the problem was people couldn't see them. People couldn't get to the movie theaters. People couldn't book the time. They couldn't get them into their houses. And so in 2000, it wasn't the case that movies were scarce. It was a case that video cassettes were scarce. And what that meant was that people who wanted to watch movies couldn't 
Now, Blockbuster made a huge business out of serving the people who could, right? But this was an artificial kind of scarcity. The availability of broadband to American households meant that we were moving to a world of abundance. When you take out that bottleneck, suddenly for the first time, the full population of movie watchers could watch movies wherever, whenever they wanted. And it showed that the market for movies was bigger than $6 billion, it was $32 billion. This is a lesson for us. Okay, so today in our market, legal advice is scarce. But that scarcity in a sense is artificial. It is limited by our brains or our ability to create documents. Legal advice is scarce because of us. But it's not legal advice that's scarce. It's lawyers' time that is scarce. So imagine what could happen if you were able to remove that bottleneck of lawyers' time, the time that it takes us to write every letter, to draft every pleading, to take the same meeting over and over again. If we could move from one-to-one -one services to one-to-many services, if we can see this moment, the age of artificial intelligence as a way of breaking through that bottleneck, isn't it very likely that the true legal service market is much bigger, that the number of clients that we could serve is much greater, that our impact and our ability to bridge the access to justice gap is much greater than we're allowing. Finally, uh, I wanna talk about uh, disruption from within. I think this is the hardest lesson to take from Netflix. And I just admire Mark Randolph and Reed Hastings so much because what they did was so creative, so, so courageous. It was amazing to disrupt their own business when it finally was successful. Uh, John Shedd says, a ship in harbor is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. I think Mark Randolph has an even better quote about this. Um, he said, of this time at Netflix, if you're unwilling to disrupt yourself, there will always be someone willing to disrupt your business for you. Isn't this exactly what Ben said 10 minutes ago? When the world changes, someone is going to meet that latent market. Someone is going to use broadband to reach into those households. Someone is gonna use artificial intelligence to provide services to the 80% of clients who need it. We have an opportunity right now. We can embrace this and we can make sure that competent, licensed, insured lawyers are at the center of this revolution. We have a choice. We will not always have that choice. The window for us to embrace this change, in fact, is closing. So we need to make sure that we are finding a way to serve that 80%, even if it cuts in a little bit to the 20% we're currently serving. We are in a transformative time and we have a choice. The choice for uh, Netflix to disrupt itself was widely mocked. There was even a skit on Saturday Night Live with Fred Armisen uh, um, uh, and uh, Jason Sudeikis mocking the decision. It's rare that a business decision is so controversial that it generates its own Saturday Night Live skit. Nevertheless, Netflix's ability to disrupt itself is something that should inspire us. When the world is changing, the most dangerous thing you can do is stand exactly still. Here's my colophon. I've told you uh, a story today about a giant dominant incumbent that wouldn't change, about a startup that disrupted it and then had the courage to disrupt itself, to kill its own startup uh, in its prime in order to reach a bigger market. That story taught us that innovation ushers broader horizons. It taught us the difference between a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. And it taught us the importance of disrupting yourself before somebody else does. 
Lawyers in America are one of the most powerful forces for social change there ever has been. But make no mistake about it, if we are serving one out of five people who needs help, somebody is going to serve the other four out of the five if we don't. This is our opportunity. And so I would just say that we have the choice whether to be Blockbuster or Netflix. I think it's pretty clear uh, based on this talk where I want you to be. We're gonna have to change our practice. It is not for me like a talking head on a stage to tell you how to change that practice. It's up to your clients. During times of scarcity, uh, all of the control is in providers, but during times of abundance, all of the power is in consumers. And in the coming times of abundance, the power is gonna be with our clients. The power is gonna be with the 80% of people who are underserved or unserved by the legal services market. The changes could be transformative in many ways. It might mean that we're going to have to adopt artificial intelligence tools in our practice to augment our capacity to serve five times as many people, maybe for double the price. We might be using tools like Visa Law's generative AI tools that they've developed in collaboration with AILA. It might be using other artificial intelligence tools that we can't even imagine today. It might mean the end of the billable hour. If hours are not critical to create documents, when they can be created in seconds, when the collective intelligence of the legal community can be harnessed and put into drafted letters, drafted pleadings, drafted filings, doesn't that mean that the time is no longer a bottleneck, that we shouldn't be charging by hours? And I know this is a particular field where AILA and immigration lawyers have always led the pack. It might mean the end of partnership models for law firms. Should we really pay out all the profits of law firms every year or should we be investing year after year and increasing shareholder stakes? So it's not really for me to tell you how this transformative time is gonna change your practice. But I will tell you that we have the choice to do things exactly the same way like Blockbuster did or to disrupt ourselves like Netflix did. History shows us Netflix was the clear winner if you need proof of that, there's no better proof than the recent series on Netflix about the very last Blockbuster store. So it turns out that there is one Blockbuster store in America, in Bend, Oregon. And Netflix has created its own comedy series set in the last Blockbuster store in America. The world has truly come full circle. This is an opportunity for us. Every year we talk about using technology to increase justice, to narrow the access to justice gap, to help people who need help but haven't been helped. This is our opportunity to reach that latent market. Now, I'll just encourage you, be Netflix, don't be Blockbuster. Thank you very much.